So to start the afternoon session, while people are gathering, we thought I would show some of the stuff we didn't get to show this morning because of the um, technical difficulties. So while people gather, like I said, this would have been a video of what would happen in a norm, what we would call a normal church service. So during, during the, the preaching of the sermon, roads would open up, songs would be sung, and people would begin to labor in the spirit. So here's a taste of that.
Okay, and on and on and on and on it goes. You can actually see them. Um, um, you see, Queen Mother's daughter, Sabira Jalani, has posted all of them on YouTube, so you can always do your own research. But as you can see, several, several, several things, several things are happening, and everything's are evolving at the same time. But for us, for sure, we're on a road. The road had several registers. We went up a hill. They changed instruments, so the writing became different. So and for us, this is real. This is not an imagined experience. So. That's all. That's all. That's all. Hot. Send this service. Because service can be cold. Service can be cold. Huh? Service, services can be cold sometimes. But um, that was, that's what happens when we're in tune. When we're in tune and everybody's working together, the whole idea of community comes together. Yeah. Well, there were some living here, but some are also, also, also visiting. This is an actual pil a pilgrimage. So here's another. Here's another. So here's another take. This colleague is, is a is a is a friend of mine from from Brooklyn. He's done a lot of search on on movement that he calls fist and heal. The idea of what black people how black people move spirit in the spirit. And he would have done some research in Trinidad 
which is a which is another home place for spiritual Baptist. And he makes the connection between what he experiences in the southern USA and what happens to him when he went to Trinidad and what happens to him when he goes to the continent. So just share, share a little bit of this. <laughs> and it might be <laughs> because it was my first <laughs> experience in the spiritual Baptist church. <laughs> but it felt <laughs> as if the entire congregation <laughs> had been lifted up <laughs> and placed in the hull of a ship. <laughs> and we were traveling, traveling to India. <laughs> Now, it's also my understanding that the spiritual Baptists can and like to travel to Africa. It's also my understanding that the spiritual Baptists have two basic concepts of Africa. You can travel and work with the Orisha in Yoruba land. <laughs> That's present day Nigeria. <laughs> or you can travel to a place of deep, <laughs> dark, <laughs> secret, <laughs> and mysteries. <laughs> the Congo. <laughs> started off by telling you about Reggie Wilson Fist and what? You know, performance group. In 1996, Fist and Heald had its first opportunity to travel to Africa. We didn't know it at the time, but we were starting to work on a collaborative project with a performance group there named Black and Pelosi in Zimbabwe. So we left JFK, got to Heathrow, had to transfer to Gatwick, Gatwick all the way down to Johannesburg, and then all the way back up to Harare, and then down to Bulawayo and then to the hotel, <laughs> and then we got a good night's rest. <laughs> the next day we got up, had a great breakfast, cut the grays in, <laughs> made it to rehearsal, <laughs> and started making introductions to the group, <laughs> sharing who we were and what we did. <laughs> and they also <laughs> were sharing who they were and what they did. <laughs> And all of them either had been or still were members of what they call the Zionist church. Now the Zionist church is also a Protestant Christian church that 
<laughs> had even more African retentions and practices within a Christian context. <laughs> so I was getting really excited. <laughs> and found out that they also had a rhythmical, <laughs> aspirated <laughs> breathing <laughs> that they used to travel spiritually on high. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been traveling in the physical world <laughs> all the way from Milwaukee and down in the Delta <laughs> with those black congregations and black ministers. <laughs> all the way down to the Caribbean. <laughs> all the way back to Africa in the physical world, <laughs> tracking these spiritual practices, <laughs> traveling, traveling, <laughs> breathing, <laughs> traveling, <laughs> breathing, <laughs> traveling, <laughs> breathing, <laughs> traveling, <laughs> breathing. <laughs> What's yours? <laughs> Okay, so that gives you a, another perspective, a more inside outsider perspective of what their experience is like. Okay, this morning we, we would have, if everything had gone differently, we would have had an opportunity to meet with the filmmaker, but we still thought we would show her film. This is um, Melanie Grant, who is a graduate from the uh, Robara Center of Creative um, Imagination. Um, she's with a distinction with, in, her, in her field and also went on to do an MA, MFA, sorry. And this film is her thesis film actually where she used the spiritual Baptist um, environment to look at a very hot, a hot, what I would call a hot topic for us in the Caribbean and probably around the world. And we thought we'd share with you to, you know, to give a visual context and also to see how she would imagine a community treating an issue like this.
Morning. Morning. For you, madam. Thank you. Are you staying for breakfast? Um, no, Mother Irene will be by shortly, so I think I should go. Okay, but before you go, close your eyes. Why? Just trust me. Close your eyes. Okay. Fine. Open. You don't like it? It's not that I don't like it. I'm sorry, I, I can't accept it. Why not? Ruth, I've been thinking and I don't think mm -hmm. it. Don't say it. Don't say it. If it's what I think you're going to say, just don't. No, I'm sorry. I can't keep doing this with you every few months, Jack. Then don't just find somebody else that has it all figured out. Stop. Stop. I'm sorry, I have to go. Jasmine. It's not going to go in just like that. Trust me. Coming. I thought we agreed to stop. Oh. Thanks. 
I don't think I'm ready to mourn yet. Can't postpone it any longer. Come on, drink, drink up. We only have an hour to get you sobered up. Are you still talking to her? And you're still not going to tell me who she is? Remember, the Lord forgives and heals even the worst of sinners. But you must pray hard and ask forgiveness for what you've done. Okay? Right, I'll be a part in the car.
All right. You want to introduce anything? So I was opening up before I think we're in that kind of post lunch slumber. <laughs> So I was just saying, if there's anyone with any comments about the film, it's probably, I think, one of the first films that kind of took you through a uh, spiritual Baptist um, uh, ritual in that kind of in that treatment of it and um, really got you to the, the intimacy of, the, of, the, of the, um, the practice and one of the ways in which uh, we begin to think about the construction of worlds and families, right? So one of the things that I think we could think through, uh, which links back to the earlier conversation about um, mourning and that particular initiatory right, and we see that within the importance of these traditions, initiation in these traditions and the different forms of which they take, right? And Throughout all, I would say, Africana practices, there is a moment of, of entry, that kind of point of being when one is called and called in different ways. Um, there's a question about healing and sometimes the healing is dealing with that sense of spiritual affliction. And when one is living in a state out of balance, because many African systems of thought share with Asiatic systems of thought about the importance of balance and the ways in which um, you are to live in perfect alignment, not only with your own ori or your head, your inner consciousness, but also the environment of which you inhabit, the natural environment, and also with your, the, your organism, your body, and with the, the various um, entities that comprise of what we could call a divine universe. So whether we are talking about, sorry, these things here, the oneness of a supreme being, but also a recognition that there's a, a family of spirits of which um, we hold close. And so to be in balance is part of the, not only the co cosmological, cosmovision center of a lot of Africana traditions, but it's also very much a part of the philosophical um, ways of conduct in a sense and the ways in which they understand the, the world and how individuals inhabit the world. So while there's an individual inhabiting the world, it, that individual inhabits space through collectivities. And when we think about the Middle Passage, the transshipment of Africans across the Atlantic, and with that a kind of severing or rupture or a disruption in that ties and the idea of what happens when family is no longer one's blood kin because that relationship has been forever severed because they were your, your siblings, your grandparents, your parents were sold to other, to plantations that extended across the Caribbean, extended across what we could call the Black Atlantic. You might have an uncle in Brazil and in, in um, Sao Paulo, you might have an aunt in the antebellum South in South Carolina, an auntie in Barbados, someone else in Jamaica, someone in Cuba. And so these rites created a space, sorry, these traditions, these um, spiritual, well, these religious traditions, these faith systems, these wisdom systems um, created a space for the construct of family to be renewed. And their initiatory practices became part of the ways in which kinship was reestablished and the important bond of family. Because while, there, while there wasn't necessarily the blood family, there was a very keen and deep understanding of the, of the importance of the communal space and the collectivity in that space. And so we find within Spiritual Baptists, within Palomonte, within um, 
Lukumi, Santeria, Orisha, um, within Kumina, a call to these traditions and a way forward through, and first of all, through a kind of um, initiation. And there are different modes of which this initiation takes place over time. And you see, it's a struggle. It's not something that someone just, you just come to it. It's often something that you're called to, oftentimes not by your own choosing. Sometimes you're often called by a higher power. And there are oftentimes internal struggles around what do you do upon that, with that call? And how do you enter? And the fact that you are not birthed alone, right? You go through, you're held in space and in time by those who usher you through the portal, through into this other life. And you, you come out of it anew. Um, the idea of the shedding, the stripping, stripping away, the closing out of the noise, um, that kind of rebirth, as it were, but the death that has to happen in order for the birth to occur, the rebirth to occur. So within this, we see indications of that struggle, of that kind of coming to a certain consciousness um, that is brought out by a deeper introspective work. And it's an introspective work that is done in community and through community and through each other, holding each other in space. Um, yes. Uh, yes. The sense of intimacy. Yes. In the community. Yes. The community and, the women. And, uh, and that's really interesting because um, this whole idea of the individual journey and, and taking that journey and 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 the trust that is needed to to join something to join something. to and to and to go on mourning the trust that is needed with the people around you to go on mourning what i didn't see and i know i know the filmmaker and the, the, the people performing a, it's a bit of an ego now are a lot of my students that i've worked with for many years at the institution but what i didn't see was what is the eye opening after laying on the ground, because she was still, you know, she was laying on the ground and the, and I know that this is a short film, but the ending was the image of the community again on the veranda when the credits were being done. But obviously the morning wasn't finished when the, that's me, that's me rationalizing, but I didn't see what is the opening of the eye because the eye became an intimate space, you know, when one is holding the other. And I didn't see what was the internal conflict of the person that was of um, the young woman playing the initiate. But I did see, what I did see was the intensity of the journey. Yes, yes. And, and the idea that even I did see the balance between individual and community. Yes. Because the idea that this one person, this person is journeying, but the community is there, but it's still this person's journey. Yes. And 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 so it, it, it's a it's a wonderful beginning. It's really, it's beautiful. It's really a beautiful film. And the intimacy and, is mm -hmm, key mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you mentioned, Sonia. So I appreciated it. And, and the use of sound, it, the need for the, the silence, so that most of the images are driven by silence, which is that whole introspective thing mm -hmm. of, of, of making that decision to make the journey, yes. to take the path. And I love the shot also of, um, of her, of Keisha, the woman in the dress walking down the hill to the environment. Yes. And the whole idea that the, 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 the filmmaker gives us is that this is a connection to something that has been frowned upon by European concepts of what is African. Yes. This is a connection to something of the wild, yeah. something of the untamed. And when we live in our houses in the West Terrace or on the hills somewhere, we are always containing the environment around us. Mm -hmm. The plant life, the tree life, we're cutting them, somebody coming in once enough to cut them. Because if we didn't do that, the wild would kind of take over. And that fear of the wild is part of what um, persists in negative ideas about yes. African spirituality yeah um, but she used the wild as a positive space as it is and so I just appreciated that the insight of the young filmmaker right. in doing it yeah Melanie yeah. yes because the insight uh the the idea of the wild and the 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 vegetation that we see is part of the 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 lushness it's also it's a life force right it's the space of which sustenance 
the sustainability of these, the fact that these traditions were able to survive in foreign lands was because there was a recognition of, I know that plant, I know that bush, I know that tree. And in some cases, a replacement of one with the other to do the work that you know would have been done before. And the intimacy that you mentioned, I mean, these traditions are highly sensuous. Um, and I use sensuous in the fullness of what it means, of sensuality um, outside of the body and within the body. But the idea that they are completely tactile, they're sensory, they're sensory. So as you're going through a service, your entire senses are awakened through sound, through touch, through smell, through sight, through taste that in any given, in any given service, service, those senses are fully saturated, um, satiated even, because it, it is part of that journey, part of the arc of coming to that oneness, part of the arc of coming into perfect alignment. So if you are only being um, attuned intellectually, mentally, and you weren't able to taste what it is, or you weren't even to, able to smell or hear, that is discordant to what it is in terms of the, 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 the thrust to have us be in alignment with our inner consciousness and also the environment of which we inhabit. Questions? Yes. I was just going to reply to Sonia. Yes. In the short, let me see, in the conflict, it was not spelt out directly or, or, and she was wondering why, which I myself was wondering why as well. But I think not spelling out was made me able to put myself into that situation. Right. And it was easier, I guess, maybe for persons to put your own conflict yeah. into it. Yeah. And your, the, for me, it was the call and maybe not yeah. responding immediately yeah. to the call. So exactly. not detailing everything was, you know, you were able to put your own situation into the film. Thank you for that. And I, I do agree that there's that idea of allowing the affliction to just stand as that without the detail and the importance of not revealing what gets revealed and the idea that revelation isn't for everybody, right? And in meaning that, when a mourner comes out of that journey, there are keys, there's information that is given to that individual that isn't dis exposed by all. So for example, within the Palo tradition, when you receive your own Nganga, which is the cauldron of which ancestral um, elements and materials are housed, you receive what's called a firma, and a firma in Spanish means signature. And all you find this in many traditions, there's a signature, there's a, there's a, a ideographic um, emblem that allows one to communicate with their, uh, their elements. So although my Nganga lives in Santiago, I could draw my firma and that unlocks my capacity to communicate directly as though it was here. But part of the, the, the power of these traditions is the element of secrecy, is the element of what gets contained and what gets concealed. And, and the knowledge that not all eyes can see or should see in the same way. And not all ears could hear. And not all that, not all, that, not all food good to eat, right? And all, all these various things. So the idea of covering up of, of concealing, of, of closing out so that you can see what is intended for you to see is also powerful. So the fact of it ending with her completely covered, but you could just imagine all of that information that's being downloaded. Um, you know, when I think that I see that and I recall Queen Imogene Kennedy, a Kumina queen from uh, Jamaica, Ibashin. And when she, um, talks of her, her story of journey of entering Mayal for 21 days at the base of a, of a silk cotton tree. And the Nkuyu spirits whispered in her ears and gave her the songs 
gave her all of the lessons and the mysteries at the base of this, these sacred trees we see dotted across our landscape. And it was at the base of the, of the tree that she received the Nkuyu messengers, Congo spirits spoke to her and gave her those teachings. And so it was in that state of, of mayal, of journey, of passaging, of traversing, um, that all of that would, that would be needed for when she came back to the land fully of the living, she would be able to impart. Lots to share, but not enough time. And I want to give space and time for our final presenter, Major Alfred Taylor, who is currently pursuing his PhD in cultural studies, working specifically um, uh, on issues of the intersections of race and class within the Anglican church in Barbados and, I, and, many, and other things that would be enveloped around such a topic. And so I turn the floor now over Good afternoon. Now, I know you've had your fill of spirit and food and intellectual stimulation, so I'll try and make this go as quickly as I can. Um, let me acknowledge Dr. Hume as my head of department, um, Dr. Hunt as lecturer and colleague, friend, I suppose, <laughs> um, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I am Alfred Taylor, and today I'm going to present briefly on what I've titled today, God and Culture. Struggled with that a little bit because, of course, how you perceive God is very much a matter of culture, and culture is complicated. <clears throat> so I've subtitled it, Contested Religious Space in Post-Emancipation Barbados. Also, you could call it How We Came to Be. Um, so I'll take you through this discourse in this general order, a quick look at church and state in early Barbados, the idea of our origin as a colonial project, a brief look at West, Af West African peoples and their spiritualities, a revisit of the idea of a colonial project, but in terms of religion, I trust you'll find that interesting, and church as hegemonic discourse. We'll have a, a little talk about that. Um, and we'll make reference to what I term the lost century, that is the immediate post-emancipation period and the century that took us into the 1930s, um, during which very little happened for Black Barbadians. Um, a little note on Transculturation, a term you may or may not know, but we'll talk about it. And conflicted religious identities. And finally, how or how not to be a church of the people of Anglican of African heritage, meaning the Anglican church. It looks sounds like a lot, but I promise you I'll get through it very quickly. <laughs> right, church and state in early Barbados. <clears throat> now the Anglican church is, is, is perhaps well regarded, generally speaking. There's no doubt about that. But when you take another look, when you, take it, when you look at it, when you take the view from below, you can come to some very different conclusions about it. And I think we owe it to ourselves to be pretty honest about this. And we know for sure that the Anglican church came to this space pretty much as a mission of colonization. 
As one author puts it, no colonizing venture was complete without its pious minister. It was accepted part of English practice that settlers were members of the church. And as, the, as uh, Professor Titus advises, as the English monarch was head of the Church of England, so was the governor of Barbados, the head of the Anglican church in Barbados, as in the colonies. So from the outset, colonial influence um, was the business. And Barbadian space was divided into parishes, as you well know. And that still exists, all those parishes still exist today. We don't give it a second thought, but this very structure of Barbados is along the lines of a colonial enterprise. And we've never thought about that very deeply because it seems so natural to us. Uh, parishes were administered by a vestry who collected taxes, maintained infrastructure, paid ministers, maintain records. So this was not just some, you know, casual exercise. This was the real world management of colonial space. And so the church became a fixed partner in the maintenance of empire, like it or not, establishing social order and control in favor of the ruling and benefiting classes. This is the reality. And the role of the church extended even further beyond mere ecclesial and administrative matters, the church engaged in what can only be described as social control. And you have to ask yourself, is this still the case? So let's be under no illusions. We are not here because of any benevolent um, approaches. We are here because we were very much part of an economic project and we were inputs to the economic system as slave labor. That is the reality. So, Sugar demanded labor, this brought us here. Along with many, many um, dispossessed white um, English, Irish, Scottish people, um, who also became very much a part of our society and still are. Estimated that between 1627 and 1807, some 387,000 West Africans were shipped to the island. And Barbados was the sort of launch point for um, plantation society right across this Caribbean space. And even, you don't think about it, but a lot of the Southern American space. You will know of the Carolinas, etc. You don't think about it, but all of that was colonial space. And free movement between what is now parts of the Southern end of the United, of, of, of North America and Caribbean was all one space but a lot of free movement back and forth, which will explain a few things a little later on. Now, Africans came, West Africans came as complete and intact people with their own spiritualities, with their own sense of identity, um, which of course, as nothing more than mere inputs to the economic machine, all of that was completely ignored, or so they, would, so, so they thought. African beliefs and customs persisted and were transmitted to their descendants, and I argue even today to us. Shaped and modified by a new environment, elements of African folklore, music, language, religion, movement, all were transported, translated with them. One of the most durable and adaptable constituents of the slave's culture, linking African past with present was, of course, religion, and we saw Wonderful examples of that this very morning. Africans have their own sense of spirituality, their own cosmology, if you like, um, belief in a high God, a supreme creator of the world. Um, but then there are slight differences into how that is interpreted across the various traditions. Um, there's a wonderful personal description from Alara Equiano um, that gives a lovely description of a real world, a real life perspective on how um, trans transported Africans actually operated and lived here. As to religion, the natives believe that there is one creator of all things, that he lives in the sun. They believe he governs events, especially our death's captivity, but as for doctrine of eternity, I do not remember to ever have heard of it, etc. But the point is that they had a very clearly 
understood way of thinking about their spirituality and the way they did, um, you know, lived their religious lives. Um, he went on, though we had no places of public worship, we had priests and magicians or wise men. They were held in great reverence by the people. They calculated our time and foretold events. These magicians were also our doctors and physicians. So a real people. Now, we generally get the impression that because a lot of that was ignored, that it didn't really have an impact. But we will find as we progress through time, this is the clincher for me, it was only after emancipation in 1834 that we see an organized effort to acculturate, not a word that I like, but we'll talk about it later, slaves to European patterns, an effort which was spearheaded by the Anglican Church. Let's be clear, Ang Africans were never just docile inputs to the labor machine. Um, there was always resistance, there was always rebellion. Um, there was always resistance to the colonial project and one of the most momentous occasions was the 1816 rebellion right here in Barbados where somehow the population got wind that freedom was coming and was somehow going to be denied and they weren't happy about it and decided to do something about it. And it was a very concerning situation. We've seen the letters um, written back and forth to the governor, from the governor to the secretary of state for war and the colonies, very serious event. Letter from um, the colonel in charge of the militia reporting the quote unquote insurrection. And of course, a, a letter from one of the soldiers on the ground, which for me as a military person is very, very striking. And I'll just take a moment to read it. I know you're getting a little tired, but I'll just highlight one or two points here because this is very important for me personally. <clears throat> First thing I'll note is that the estate, which this thing kicked off belonged to Reverend name, blanked out for, I guess, obvious reasons. Um, but towards the end of it, um, the very last paragraph there, I show you the conduct of our Bourbon Blacks, particularly the light company under Captain Firth and Old Palpan has been the admiration of everybody and deservedly so. That was a regiment of black soldiers that shot at the, their fellow Africans. Right, so I put it to you that that 1816 rebellion was so momentous and so scary that not only the use of brutal suppression and physical force was required or used, but it was so scary that another approach, this is my thesis, had to be taken. And that is the use of soft power. What could not be achieved at the end of the, at the point of a gun was achieved, and I dare say is still in train today in the use of soft power by the church. William Hart Coleridge was appointed bishop in 1824. You will note that that is not even 10 years after 1816. I feel there's a connection. When I find the evidence, I'll give it to you. But what I can tell you is that whether or not there was an actual mission, the effect of his presence and his actions was lasting, the effect and impact. He started a considerable church building program, set up, refreshed the administrative machinery of the diocese, recruited um, local clergy, and engaged in education and Christianization. And this, this is not, these are not my words, this is, this is proper research, documented research. He, for, he formulated the principles of pastoral care for the enslaved populace and shaped local attitudes toward African culture. Social and religious practices of Africans considered a tremendous challenge, his words, to his church. So, Bishop Coleridge turns up and he does his thing. Now we have to talk about hegemony and space. It's a little academic, but you will get my point quickly, I hope. When we talk about space, um, especially in cultural studies, we use this metaphor because in relation to culture, because culture 
is complicated. It is plural, it is fragmented, it is contested, and it is understood only in the space that it marks out. This could be geographical space, ideological space, I dare say religious space. Wherever complex groups are interacting, there is that um, idea of space. As for space and Coleridge in his churches, distinctions in seating between the whites at the front, the not so well off white behind them, coloreds and free coloreds and blacks towards the back, and the enslaved people can make their way to the gallery. That was the way things were. And I wonder sometimes if this is a, is a, there's a psychological impression that's, that, that's lived, that lives with us today. Because if you notice, you go to an Anglican church, it always fills up from the back. As if we haven't quite understood that, hey, it's our church now. We can go all the way to the front if we want to. And as the numbers grew through his evangelizing, our bishop, uh, rather than use the full space of the church, he built more churches just so he would not have to disrupt that ordering of space along clearly racial lines. And that's just the truth. That's the reality. In fact, if you go to some of our churches, you can look at the on the pews and still see numbers. So the great and beneficial improvements which took place after his arrival are perhaps unparalleled in the history of the colonies. So, so says Schomburg, but is that really so? I think history has been very kind, um, but the view from below gives us cause for pause. The Coleridge legacy was to convert, quote unquote, civilize the quote unquote heathens who were really only practicing their religion. Um, the hegemonic use of space and power in the way the liturgy was, was conducted and today is still conducted in similar fashion. Education or rather schooling of very much a colonial nature, which means that you, it's difficult to argue with anybody of a particular age who will never believe anything bad about the mother country because they were taught that everything about it was great. The Church of England was the proper and perhaps the only way to God. Well, clearly we can debate and discuss that today and we know how that is gonna end. Supported and enforced race and class structure, which if we look in today's Barbados is still evident. It started way back then. And in terms of our music and hymn, etc., resolutely English to this very day. And people who try to break out of that mold are sometimes successful. And those who aren't become spiritual Baptists. <laughs> so the, the suppression of natural instincts of Africans for socializing and for their religious and spiritual expression, you know, was disrupted and quite deliberately so. This, this is fact. The imposition of church and school reinforced in inequalities and prejudices, which still have effect today. This is fact. The divergent social order, which lasted for generations, this is fact. Look at who owns business in Barbados today. Look at who are the workers in Barbados today. I rest my case. Now, I have to mention power. I have to define hegemony. And I have to talk a little bit about representation. Power is usually directed against the subordinate or excluded group. In, Bar in plantation Barbados, who would that be? That's right. Yeah, people like us, the other. And um, with always an attempt to impose the norms of the dominant class. Could that be said of the church, the Anglican church? Yeah, yeah I'm saying it. <laughs> Hegemony is a subtle form of power. And this is its, its beauty. That commands consent on many fronts while appearing natural and inevitable. Agreed? Reality. And representation, another word we must use in cultural studies, connects meaning and language to culture. And it uses language, signs, images, etc., to represent or describe the world between members of a culture. 
So when you grow up and you go to the church and you see these wonderful stained glass windows and you see these wonderful images of, and it looks nothing like you, what are you being taught psychologically until you decide, hmm, let's, let's take another look. Amen. Now, but I, I must say, I can't just pick on the Anglican church because there were lots of other churches around all pretty much engaged in the same kind of activity. We had the Moravians, the Methodists, the American Baptists came, the Evangelical churches came, the Wesleyans, the Salvation Army, Church of God, Seventh-day Adventists, the Nazarene, the Pentecostals, the Barbadian Christian Mission, and we even have Gnostics. But all of them take an approach somewhat similar to the Anglican Church, even though they have their own sort of denomination and um, dogmatic biases. But look how it works. Repetition, a sense of order and structure, which is not to be breached, otherwise you're not doing it right. Controlled movement, especially in the Anglican church. Hymn and word, again, language and representation. If you analyze a lot of the hymns, a lot of the language clearly states um, that, you know, there it is, yes. <laughs> Um, I'm pleased that the spiritual Baptist have, have, has broken out of the idea of control movement, but there's still repetition, and there's still order, and there's still hymn and word. It is amazing to me when I, when I um, observe spiritual Baptist um, services, it is Anglican theology with a very Barbadian accent and lots of movement, but the underlying theology is exactly the same. You can thank Bishop Coleridge for that. So thorough a job was done that your underlying theology has not changed. Same thing with Rastafari, very different expression, but don't touch the King James version of the Bible for them. We move on. What I call, what I term the lost century where there was no economic promise, pro progress for the formerly enslaved population. What did they get instead? A steady diet of church and school, all colonial. Is it any wonder why we are a little conflicted sometimes? You know, this has happened to us for a very long time. But another interesting thing happened, transculturated spiritualities. The theology, a lot of the liturgy of the Anglican church meshed and collided and blended with the innate African spirituality, which just, it didn't really go anywhere. It was submerged, but it didn't go anywhere. And whenever there's a collision, something new emerges, something new and enjoyable as we've seen today. And this comes out of, um, there are lots of terms, this creolization, which is an attempt, attempt to explain the social dynamics that have produced various aspects of our culture. We have syncretism and bricolage and hybridity and symbiosis and mess, all sorts of things to describe why we end up such an interesting mesh. I didn't say mess. <laughs> but the word I think that best describes it was coined by Fernando Ortiz, where he talks about transculturation. Um, and because that's how cultures work, you know, there was never, there's never a dominance. There's never a wiping out. There's always a residual, um, but it's never all, it, it is never untouched either. So there's this meshing, there's this blending, there's this binding, there's this creation of something new, which we can celebrate. And spiritual Baptist, perfect and beautiful example of this, even if the theology is still very Anglican. <laughs> So we have the same spiritual Baptists, we have the Rastafarians, um, which retain a strong association with Christian theology and um, certainly with scripture. Now, I must tell you that in this very room, I was examined in things like biblical studies, Old Testament literature and New Testament literature, and some of the things that taught me in this very, examined me in this very room, it made me go to that other room and pray real hard. And so there is this tension between what we know 
and what we think we still need to believe. Even my friends in the Gnostic church, that, there's a little church there on River Road where I have some very close friends. Would you believe that every Sunday, all of their hymns come from, guess where? Hymns ancient and modern, complete with organ, if you please. And these are Gnostics, conflicted space. So we have a wide variety of, of, of religious expressions, etc. cetera. Um, and in fact, I did a quick survey from the uh, population census. Please tell them to publish the 2020 census. I need to know the answer to this. What is gonna happen with the Anglican numbers? Are they gonna go back up or are they gonna keep going down? I'm watching the one that's labeled none, the second column from the left, where there are a lot of people in Barbados, this very Barbados who said, look, I, I don't know how to call it. I'm not even bothering. And they're followed by the Pentecostals and everybody else kind of, the Adventists are doing very well, by the way. And the others are kind of, Methodists are trying to hold firm. The Catholics, well, it was always a small number, but maintaining their, their presence, but it gets all the way down from there. I think the spiritual Baptists are, in here somewhere? Oh, sorry, you're not here because guess what guys? You weren't thought significant enough of faith to actually make the census. You gotta do something about that. <laughs> okay, so this is an interesting chart for me and this is the heart of my research. If you look at this chart under the label Pentecostal in 1960, it was about 10% of the population. By 2010, it was 20, 25% 20, or thereabouts. The Anglicans in 1960 approached 60% 60 of the population. In 2010, they're about 25% of the population. So somehow the rise in Pentecostalism is kind of like matching the downward slope in Anglicanism. I don't know for sure, that's what my research is about. I'm gonna put some names and faces and details to those to those trends. But the one that concerns me personally most is the next one labeled none. In 1960, most people were churchgoers. Today, they level peg with the Anglicans, the nuns, sorry, the Anglicans, the Pentecostal, and the nuns are just about level pegged. That's an interesting situation in Barbados. And of course, then all the others put together kind of make up another 25%. A very interesting time and place in Barbados. I cannot wait for the 2020 census. So conflicted religious identities. This slide is deliberately blank because it is not very often I will find in one room such a educated um, and experienced audience. So I want you to tell me so I can make notes for my research. Do we have conflicted religious identities in Barbados? If you say yes, you have to give me an example of why you think so. By, by conflict, I mean, okay, um, do people kind of like not know where they should go or how they should be or which is the right church or which is not? You might, you might want to use the mic, so, okay. Um, so I have some friends um, whose children are, I would say, pretty much conflicted or at least searching because their parents are more of an Eastern mm -hmm. or African persuasion, and yet they're going to a Christian school mm -hmm. or at least, you know, the traditional Barbadian primary school. Church so at school. home, they're getting, okay, we're going to go to the, you know, we're going to go to the beach and we're going to do our you know, our ISIS and our whatever praises and so on and right. so forth to whoever. And then at, at school, they're getting the Lord's Prayer right. and Jesus. So yeah, right. they are conflicted. Great. So noted. I'm wondering if it's affected by power because in the 50s and 60s and the 30s, 40s, whatever, if you wanted your child to get into a school or get a job when they come out, you go to the priests. And the priest would take down the name and say, you part of the congregation. The priest's word was very important. So there are a lot of people that went to church just to be in, just to get in the power. And I wonder if since the switch 
to government, the balance between government and state and church has shifted. And if there's the shift to um, government power, you don't have to go there anymore to the priest to get it. You don't even have to go to the priest to sign you thing no more to say you use a living human being. You can go to, um, you know, one of the, what do you call them? Justice of the priest or whatever and get it. So the, the priest was so important and church was so important. So I wanted to what extent is also an action of power that people are not committing to a church. Me too. Once, when I find the answer, I'll probably get my PhD. But could it be though that in 1960, 70, 80, 90, 2000, maybe see that downward slope that that is part of the part of the issue. It could be if you didn't need the all powerful priest anymore, maybe you didn't have to go to his church. Um, yes, and thank you very much for um, this very interesting reflection on the um, impact of the church. Um, yes, there are many people who are conflicted because, as was said earlier. We go to church on Sunday, Catholic, Anglican, and we go to the obey priest on Sunday night, <laughs> Monday, Monday night. And, and so we're conflicted because, only because the book religions, what I call the book religions, Islam, Christianity, insist that if you are part of one, you can't be involved in the other, exclusive in another one. Um, so enslaved Africans in the Caribbean didn't have that concept because most West African indigenous traditions, they add, they add religious past, spiritual past, rather than having one mutually exclusive. So when the, the, the priests were baffled by the fact that a mother would have her child baptized by the Methodist priest who was around. And then the next week, if an Anglican priest comes, she would go and get him baptized with that one. And if a Catholic priest comes, the whole idea was to accumulate as much power as possible. <laughs> so the conflict really is because we went and allow ourselves to be completely pervaded and, and internalized the Christian habit of exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I, I can add to that, that I am Anglican, huh? and happily so. But if I have a burning physical or spiritual issue, I go and talk to my Orisha friend, real thing, because I don't find that they're in conflict at all. Um, it takes a little I courage to admit that, but it's true. I have a I have a difficulty you now because I'm I'm conflicted now because from 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 the last statements by by um, Yannick there was a suggestion that we are no longer separate that there is no conflict now for you to ask and insist that there is conflict I am a little conflicted I'm also <laughs> conflicted by the fact by what Derek just said, because mm -hmm. Derek is suggesting that the, 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 well, he said the book religions are the one that do it. Now, I know that the spiritual Baptists are also the book religion, but I stood in a sermon by the Bishop Granville Williams and heard him condemn Rastafari. There are, that's the thing that hasn't been talked about much mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. since we've been here this morning. We've been talking as though there's just a, we are all one big happy family. So I'm, I want to say two things, that's something that is a paradox. So there's a conflict in what I'm going to say. There are very strict lines drawn between a lot of the religions that we, the, the, the expressions of faith that we are talking about here. There are strict lines drawn between them. Because if you listen to what people, I'm not talking about if you listen to the, the academics, I'm talking about if you listen to people who are practicing the religions, right? But to ask if their people are conflicted is to assume, so I said I was going to say a paradox, mm -hmm. is to assume that a person who is going to the Providence Methodist Church on Sunday morning and Granville Spiritual Baptist um, Church Cathedral for the evening service that that person is conflicted. 
How do you know the person is conflicted? Conflicted is being defined right now as if you're doing more than one thing at a time. That's part of the question. Right. Yeah. So I'm so I and I so I put those two. There are lines, there are tensions because there are lines that are drawn. But we also have to wonder who it is that we are talking about there. Yeah. Is it the academic theorizing that we are using to be able to describe the world? Or are we talking about what people are actually saying about what they mm -hmm. feel? about mm -hmm. themselves. That's the point of the discussion. <laughs> yes, please. Um, my mother is St. Lucian and I grew up in, well, grew up, went to the Catholic church. And as I got older, no, as a young girl, little girl, living in an Anglican society and as a Catholic, you were almost shamed to say you were a Catholic. When it is what or be a, when I believe in spirits, when I believe in all kinds of things. So as a young Catholic, and not only me, my sisters, my mother's friends and so on, growing up in the 1960s, 70s, early 80s Barbados, the concept of being a Catholic about church. When I listen to how spiritual Baptists were, quote unquote, I just using it little thing. Let me say demonize. As a Catholic, that is how we were in Barbados, you know? And in terms of conflict, now my mother, she was a, no, my father's Bajan, he's Anglican St. Mary's Church. He was a very traditional Barbadian man, very dominating what he says go. But the one concession he gave to my mother was that her children will grow up as Catholics. At Christmas, he would head down to St. Mary's and we would go to the Catholic church. That's the one concession that he gave mommy. And that experience of well, I went to the Catholic school as well. That was another whole story in terms of how, as a young girl, how in Barb, you go to the Catholic church, them is do that, them is do the next, them is do the third. Yeah, you work with that. To the extent, what, it got to a stage where my mother took all of us out of the Catholic church, due to the persuasion and the influence of a teacher in quote unquote the village to take us to any primary school, we would get a better chance there. Mm. You know, so the whole question of conflicted now, I'm a big old woman now, I've made decisions. And because of a lot of other influences, one from my experience with the nuns and so on, I've decided that everybody got a story. It's a story that's me, I'm not conflicted about it. So I will come to these events. I am fascinated about the role of church, religion, spirituality on people, on schools, on environment. But they are there, and I hear my little world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I can't I can't separate my experience as a young Catholic growing up in my Anakin Barbados and how we were treated to understanding of how I feel about religion and churches and so on and so forth. So I don't know if that's any help. <laughs> okay, so I'm watching the time, so. <laughs> Richard Marlin, okay, yeah. Good. Good afternoon. I would say that the conflict exists. And I came up in a time in Barbados, I wanted to talk to Murray, where my mother, never went to church, but they had to go to church every Sunday and more than one church. So on mornings, it was the Church of God. On the afternoon, it was St. Mary's. And when St. Mary's finished, you go to the First Baptist in the Constitution, Constitution Road. So, and then when times change, it was Sister Thompson, whose church was in the, in the area where we lived. So, I came up in that era. I think that 
the conflict comes from people's personalities and how they view religion. And Christians have a tendency to be combative in believing that their religion is the only true religion. And that is one of the reasons why we get a lot of the conflict. Now, another thing that happens is, let me look at the spiritual Baptists in Trinidad, especially. When the prohibition came, the people had to go into the forest and worship. So out of this experience, we find that a lot of different doctrines, practices came out within the spiritual Baptist community. So within the spiritual Baptist community, the diversity of worship has also created conflict. So, I mean, and if you go to a lot of denominations, I'm sure that the bishop might be challenging the Anglican church because he wanted to bring drums in the church. When they brought the steel band into the Catholic church, people had a problem with that. So it depends on how you are willing to respect a person's belief system. And my thing is, I will respect you wherever you choose to find God, the creator, or the matter, wherever you find God. And whatever you're comfortable with is important. I think that is the key. Wherever you find God and where you're comfortable is important. Because we can only know God in two ways. One is through faith, believing, and the other way is by his self-revelation, where God reveals himself to you. He can reveal himself to you as an Anglican, as a Catholic, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, because God is not a religion. God is not a religion. And when we come to that realization, then we respect each other and be comfortable with what other people do. In this spiritual Baptist community, I said, I think there was a time when it was a spiritual Baptist at Sons of God, where when we went to other churches, we criticized everything that they did because we were told that what they were doing was wrong. But I have a different concept. No, because I have exposed myself to have an understanding of what they do and why they do it. For instance, um, Ben Harcourt was teaching at Codrington. He would have the students come, those who were doing Caribbean relig religiosity, and who wanted to choose Spiritual Baptist as their, their theme, they came to us. And it's only when we started to explain certain things that we do, they understood, and they said, but it is something like what we do in the Anglican Church. And if the Anglicans are really mindful, then they will realize that they do a lot of things that in the Catholic Church. And you go down the line just like that. So it's a case of showing respect for what other people do. Because at the end of the day, God is not going to well, judge us by religion. It is how we treat each other and how we respect the environment that we live in. Thank you. All right. So let me, let me wind all that up by asking a simple question. Do we not own and control our space? This is what independence is. No? I, I will leave that with you. Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, religious space. Okay. Oh, one it's more. It's not a question, it's more of a statement. Yes, please. Coming from... Hello? Gotcha. Coming from someone that is younger than basically everyone in this entire mm -hmm. room, I think the conflict doesn't lie in religion. The conflict lies in the feelings that are affiliated with the religion. So for me, who was raised in a very culturally diverse place, I've always found it hard when people ask me, where are you from? I've always found it hard when people say, What's your religious affiliation? And it's like, what is it? Because it is no designated. We always have this search to put a box to everything. And there is no box to it because how I was raised, my mother raised me in a manner where I was exposed to almost every different type of religion, which I was appreciative of. 
but it's also become difficult because I suffered with that question when I got into university because you would go to class and you would say something and then realize, whoa, I'm a little too awoken for this conversation <laughs> in this space. And it created conflict. So the conflict laid in my feelings towards what I was talking about, the feelings towards what I knew, because what I knew was not one dimensional. What I knew wasn't of the surface. What I knew, I can't tell you a scripture hand by hand. No, I can't do that. Some people can, but it's also not, I don't have a duty to, because that is not my calling. Mm -hmm. I don't have a duty to fall within a specific religious affiliation. And I've been blessed and like, everyone who is suffering now in a sense suffering not as in pain but suffering because my generation is suffering in the sense of they have parents who are very traditional in you must be either an Adventist and stick to an Adventist and their religious beliefs you must be an Anglican because I have friends that either Adventist or Anglican and stick to being an Anglican right and what happens is you can only be in certain spaces but me who has been exposed to many different religions. I've been able to be in many different spaces okay. and know when there's certain um, knowledge that I know that can be used in spaces and which knowledge cannot be used in other spaces. If you think about Santeria, Santeria, I can go to Cuba and know, okay, I know how to greet you because I can see from a mile away that you're a Santeria. I see that ED on your hands. I know this Iliki is not a necklace. I know that it would be disrespectful for me to touch you up because you are Yahoo. I know what it means to be rebirthed. Never mind you really shouldn't be on your road, but nevertheless. Um, or that, you know, as someone being going to a Catholic school, which was also another conflict because they taught Saturday in my Catholic school and they taught it not the best. The names were very wrong. <laughs> the pronunciation was also wrong. And also how they felt that we worshipped and practiced was also wrong. And it created an issue with my... The sister, the sister was like, no, excuse me, you're disrupting my class. And I was like, no, you're teaching them wrong, though. Right. And I met that in a respectful way. I wasn't disrespectful. She realized I wasn't being disrespectful. But she also realized that I was clearly knowledgeable, more knowledgeable in what she was talking about than she knew I was. Right. Because it's not Chango. You know what I mean? Okay. It's Chango. And Chango has different spellings depending on where you are. So allowing the conflict lies in the feelings that the society puts towards you. So the idea of telling you that I'm wrong for saying that, it wasn't that I was wrong. It's just that you were not knowledgeable. And I'm here to show you that I'm grateful in a Catholic church, you're allowing to talk about a religion that has been oppressed and is still seen as this crazy thing. And it's also, they're like, people would tell me, oh, so you practice Vodou? And I'm like, you, you're, you're, not, you're not understanding. They're, 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 those are two different practices yes things might combine and you might see a mesh in these things but it's not that you need to see that how I practice it there may not be a physical book but that does not mean that it's not a valid religion and that's the problem where there's no physical there's no physical doctrine that I can quote something by they're like no you're wrong but what we need to realize is religion isn't always based in a book and book is also interpretation and Last but not least, when we view, when we, I did sociology for Kate and my question was the decline in, ironically, Anglican presence or the presence of youth within the church. Mm -hmm. And I did a questionnaire on commerce students because that's who I went to, up and on everyone. Um, but, <laughs> but um, when I did it, you know, when I did it, what had happened was a lot of the students had said their conflict came from the fact that their parents told them, no, it must be this way. So as I said, it's not the religion that creates conflict. It's the people and how they, first of all, preach it and your parents and how they raise you. They're raised very close-minded, you know, and that's not okay. And that's where the conflict lies because they want to, you see Rastafari and be able to, you know, smoke and they think, oh, well, let me smoke too. But you don't know what they do. They don't, you don't know that connection that they have. It's not just a, a, a split to them. It's deeper than that. So I think that that is something that happened. And that's why there's a decline 
I do not believe that there's going to be a rise. I'm sorry, unless our upcoming generations of parents create that space where we're not putting children into, you must be a part of this because I am and because my people were. And if you start doing that, then you will see an increase in religion and youth amongst the churches on a whole. Just don't expect it to be a specific church. It shouldn't be, oh, I need us youth to be in a specific church. Just have youth in religion, period. When you have youth involved in religion, let them seek what they want to specifically look at, right? So I think that that's when you will get a rise within our youth. Mm -hmm. If you continue to close them in, they're not going to want to come to church. They're not going to want to be a part. And that's all I have to say. Uh, what's, what's her name? Naya. Naya? Naya. Naya Cuadra. Naya. Yeah. Listen, this to me was the most important contribution of the entire day. Let me summarize, Naya. And this works for everybody. Keep an open mind. Keep an open heart. Keep an open spirit. Be aware. Be respectful. That's it. That works. Okay, so my final slide um, illustrates that my church, the Anglican Church, really is trying, really is trying to find a, a medium or a process that works for everybody. Let me play you two, two very quick um, clips. Which will recognize the key area and glories. Organ and all. That was version one. This happened the following year or thereabout. Same liturgy. I think I know which one I prefer. Two very different expressions of the same liturgy. The church is aware and is trying. But what really um, interests me about those two clips, if you look at the, the, the movement of the people in them, there's a distinct difference. There's also an indication that not everybody's sure. Not everybody's sure. So, but the work continues. And if we proceed with open mind, open heart, open spirit, uh, we think we will make some progress. That, was the final slide. Um, we know declining membership. Hopefully we can fix that with some advice. Some people complain that the, the faith is a little empty, doesn't do very much for them. Maybe we can do something about that, um, Principal Clark. There's a general religious apathy as reflected in the numbers. Maybe we can do something about that. Again, with open mind, open heart, open spirit. Um, and there are new cultural explorations. A lot of people are moving to other, other faiths that feel more comfortable to them, including Anglicans who go to church on Sunday. And I've already had your thoughts. And that, 
I've already answered your questions or taken your questions. So all is left for me to say is thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Alfred. Um, ooh. <laughs> Before we move into the final part of our day's activity, I just want to introduce you to Desiree Baptiste, um, who's been is a researcher in the UK, and she is here in Barbados because she's been able to produce a play based on the story of an enslaved woman. So I will not say anything more, just let her speak to you. Desiree. Thank you, Principal Clark. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my play is called Incidents in the Life of an Anglican Slave, written by herself. And the title is very much influenced by a famous narrative by an American enslaved woman, Harriet Jacobs, which some of you might recognize. Um, my play is based on a real letter that was written 300 years ago by an enslaved woman, a slave, enslaved person in Virginia. We don't know the um, gender of the person. And I built a play around that document, which is 300 years old this year. Um, I was able to perform the play at UE two nights ago. And because I'm here for a little bit longer, I um, spoke with Principal Clark about possibly doing the play here and we would like to do it on Sunday at 5 p.m. and you're all invited. It's one hour long, so it's not like a, a long thing. It's a monologue play, um, which I will present as an author reading, and I would be thrilled if, if you would all come. Okay, thank you. The play is worth seeing. No, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging the thing. I went to it, the play is absolutely worth seeing. Thank you. Well, it's it's a performance because I know a lot of it by heart and the lady would be able to perhaps say, but it, okay, it is actually a performance and an author reading because there are times in the performance where I rely on looking at the text because I don't know the script 100% yet because I'm not actually an actor. Uh, we haven't actually done a professional performance yet because we're raising the funds for that. But in the meantime, because I want to get the message out and because I think it's an important story. And also part of the story takes place here at the Codrington Estate, where my character witnesses the experience of the enslaved on the Codrington Estate. It feels very important to do it here. So sorry if there was confusion between performance and reading. It's both but I would love if you would all come because it's an interesting experience and it tells the story of our ancestors. Thank you. We're actually gonna do it um, in our natural amphitheater, <laughs> um, using the lake as a backdrop and, and the college as a backdrop. And it will be between the two silk cotton trees and bring a blanket or bring something to sit on and we just have an outdoor session that's to, on Sunday evening at five o'clock, right? So that's the context, All right? Bishop. We all here. Oh, well, thank you again to, um, for you, the audience, for being here, for being open, receptive to the information, to the sharing, to the energy, um, to all of the panelists, a deep bow of gratitude to all of you to your, for your research. And, um, for your, your dedication, your willingness to share your works in progress and wishing you all very well as you continue to um, do that work. And to my colleague, friend, Canon Reverend Dr. Michael Clark, who, Really, you know, um, I thank you for being that thorn in my side <laughs> in a good way, because <laughs> uh, again, we started this conversation in 2020 and it would get hot and then it'll go dormant and it'll get, 
And then he, you know, there was a certain insistence in his very subtle way. But somehow I knew in this last time, he was like, yeah, we really got to get this guy. And so I'm really grateful for your patience and for your, your insight and your foresight in terms of really seeing this space as needing this kind of conversation to take place and the recognition that it's not a, a one off and close up shop, but there's um, space for a lot more musings and, and reflections. As we know, Barbados for its, salt, its small size, it's so incredibly rich. Um, the sacred tapestry of this country is quite interesting. Um, even within Ifa Orisha practices, there are so many lineages that find themselves here from Nigeria, Panama, uh, Cuba, uh, Trinidad, all here, different um, expressions of spiritual Baptist. We're seeing the lineage from Trinidad, Grenada, St. Vincent, and right here in Barbados, different expressions of the Baptist faith as it as it has creolized in this region from the faithists and the revivalists who are here, various expressions of Christianity, various expressions of Rastafari house mansions and houses. And so there's a, quite a lot of room to cover as we begin to hold these talks, these conversations, uh, to begin to engage these different communities of brethren and sistren who walk a path um, towards a greater sense of themselves as divine spirit beings, spirit beings having a human experience right, this time around. And so we thank you. And I just want to thank all uh, our media specialists who was taking photographs, our IT specialists here who kept us connected to a broader world out there, to the various people who wrote in inquisitively from Ghana, Zimbabwe, Brazil, I mean, people were writing to say, can we join? I can't, you know, we are gonna tap in virtually. So clearly there is something that we were offering that people were hungry for. And while we know we couldn't have satiated everyone's appetite, some people came looking for lamb and they got pork, some people went for pork, they got chicken. But I'm hoping that everyone got at least a little piece of something in their plate that they could walk away with and feel that they, um, are enriched and 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 uh, nourished with what they were served today, humbly, modestly, but from heart and with respect and with devotion, um, in the spirit of community and in the spirit of love. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Principal. Thank you, Dr. Hume. In the spirit of when we came, we opened, acknowledging the ancestors and the divine energies. And so as we end, we would like to honor them with that. What we are offering to do is that we will do a, a, a closing of this space, allowing the spirits that have been activated here to go and rest. And then we will take everything that we have here and on the table, we will do a procession down to an area called the labyrinth and offer a little blessing there and proceed to take everything to the land by the cotton tree, so that we will offer everything that we have here and our energies in, in um, appreciation for allowing us to be here today. Okay, so feel free to follow us. Feel free to take something from the table. Let's leave nothing behind on the table because everything will go to the, the tree. Fruits. You can take the maracas, but don't leave them there. You can use them. Yeah. Okay, and I'll invite my my members from my community to join me as we as we help sanctify the space. We thank the Lord for this offering. Thank you.